this is the chance for you guys to ask questions about, um, you know, did, keep us on task. Did we answer the question, how green are plug-in vehicles? What questions still remain? I'm gonna throw one out there while folks are, are lining up. Um, and that has to do with um, hype versus reality, right? There's something about cars that are so attractive and we all, you know, many of us drive them and, and there's something that just, uh, you know, th those machines are just so cool for so many people. So when you think about making a big change to an electric drive vehicle, and electric cars are fast. That's a big part of the equation too. They're gonna be fast, fun vehicles. Are we getting too excited about the environmental benefits when you consider all of these different factors that line up that you know it's it, it's not so clear cut it's in certain parts of the country as as was pointed out uh, in certain parts of North America uh, it's a better choice than others um, you know there have there have to be a lot of different things that align so are, are electric cars being overhyped as an environmental solution Luke you want to well, I would just say that one thing that you have to realize, and as I mentioned in my talk, there, there needs to be a parallel process here of cleaning up the grid and getting these vehicles out on the road. The, the fact is that it takes us on average 15 years um, at least to turn over the fleet. So if you don't start now, you're going to be waiting and waiting, and then all of a sudden you're going to, you know, it's going to be a crash course, a crash finish to try to get those large reductions. So, um, while it's important to keep in mind what the cost of these vehicles are going to be and that consumer acceptance is, is, is going to take some time, if you don't start early, you're not going to get in that game. And if, just as an example, hybrid vehicles, right? Toyota will tell you they've been making the Prius for 10 years, but what are, they, what are hybrid vehicle sales in the U.S.? They're 3% of new sales, right? So, yeah, less. Um, you know, my hope is that with... Uh, electric drive vehicles, we can go a lot faster because hybrids sort of pave the way in a lot of ways. Um, uh, but we need to we need to start. I, I would just add uh, and agree with Luke and and say that uh, I think Luke pointed out very well that a large reduction in GHGs from transportation is not an easy thing. We have to reduce VMT, we have to reduce the CO2 intensity of a fuel, and we have to have very efficient vehicles. So we, the uh, the sooner we get started, the better. And I think uh, that electric drive has a, a definitely a, a large role to play, and it has a significant potential to be a uh, one of the one of the largest solutions. There's a lot of questions, so I'm going to try to get to everybody. But by the way, VMT is vehicle miles traveled. First question, please. Uh, Bela Lazarus, I'm the sustainability editor with Business in Vancouver. Um, I admit there are a lot of this, uh, the details and the statistics. Um, you know, this time in the afternoon on Friday was hard to follow. So I just want clarification. It was my understanding that the difference between a regular combustion engine and the hybrid vehicles or the plug-in hybrids, the, the main question had to do with um, the change in resource use based on the creation and destruction of the battery. And I'm wondering if that's correct or if it, if it pertains to the majority of the resources used? If so, like, because in, in David's um, demonstration, there were all different parts of the vehicles right. seem right. to be using the resources. I'm wondering what is the difference? Is the battery the main component sure, to the higher? Right, I, I understand. And I'm okay. going to, maybe I'll moderate a little more aggressively here to make sure we get through to everybody. Quick question for David. What percentage of the these vehicles are the rare earth metals that have these, uh, you, you didn't really discuss like how detrimental or how destructive the, the, the rare earth metals are to, to process. Uh, is, is this a major factor in the manufacturing of these cars in the, in the overall equation from your perspective? Uh, I'll try to balance that answer for the, uh, the questioner. Uh, all of these metals can be recycled. And as you start ramping up production of the cars, the recycle pool will grow as well. That will take stress off the new new source uh, ident identification. Uh, I would suggest that we are not going to mine anything in any way that's detrimental to the environment. Nobody coming out of our present education system would deliberately uh, damage or harm the environment. Okay, so. How about Costa? And you, you know, you've looked at the whole life cycle. Are the batteries the big issue, or is it in use, or where does it rest? No, I think uh, batteries 
impacts, you know, we're talking about GHGs. Now, Luke, um, um, David can talk a little bit more about the local environmental impacts, which are also significant. But GHGs, the batteries are fewer than 10% of the life cycle GHGs for the, for the vehicle. Um, we found 2 to 5% for lithium. Of course, that depends on what your electricity is. But I guess the, for your purposes, know that the batteries are not the biggest uh, uh, impact. Uh, so, the, so what is? The combustion of gasoline and, and fossil fuels to power, to make electricity for the vehicle's use. It's roughly like 80% in use versus 20% production. Absolutely. Okay, next question. <clears throat> yes, hi, James Murphy from UBC. Uh, Brad, you asked the question at the end, did we answer the relevant question here? And I think Constantine showed us how to answer that. Uh, showed us the life cycle assessments. But um, I have to direct my question to the fifth member of the panel here, who's actually not here. He's the representative of the electricity generation utilities, who can tell us what is the current mix of generation and the carbon intensity of that generation, and what are the future plans? Because from what I've seen, it's not very clean in the US, at least, and it's not going to be getting a whole lot cleaner. There's still a lot of coal planned, and uh, he's not here, but perhaps you can speak to that. Uh, uh, in what I mentioned uh, in our study, what we looked at was what's the marginal electricity uh, needed to charge a vehicle? And, and as, as I said, we looked at carbon policies being put in place. So. Um, Absolutely, we, these vehicles are cleaner than the vehicle mix that we have today. Uh, and going forward, we will continue to be in that place and actually be in a better place if we put a carbon policy in place on the electricity sector. So it's, as I mentioned, you know, from my organization's perspective, curbing global warming is our number one strategic priority. We put all our resources uh, practically into trying to get a, a Senate bill passed, and uh, it's it's because uh, we need this parallel approach, both on. I mean, and, we, and, we need it on and also, all isn't it true? Uh, it's some argue that it's easier to clean the grid. Not that it's easy, but it's easier to clean the grid in a sort of a central centralized strategy. To and the grid, the grid is getting greener uh, than it is to to clean up the. I don't know, we're, we're, close to, we're close to a billion cars on the global park, right? We're some projecting two billion cars in the global park in the next couple of decades with the growth of China. Isn't it easier to clean up the grid than to clean up all the cars that are running about? Well, I think that... Well, uh, let, let's survive. Uh, can I, if I could also make a comment? I think the, the jump to thinking that the electricity to charge these cars has to come from the grid is wrong. I mean, there is a very... Uh, clear and easy way of taking care of your own energy needs for your shelter and your mobility. And I mean, it's just a question right, with, of with design. With all due respect, though, we didn't see any prices on how much these vast PV panels would cost. Can you talk about those? Well, no, I did show it for the, for the car. I mean, 2.2 kilowatts of PV was installed on the roof. Uh, to be uh, available to the car. The installed 2.2 kilowatts is about $6,000. Put that in your mortgage, amortize it over 30 years, and the, all the, that spreadsheet is uh, available for you to look at more closely and send me your comments. But basically, it comes down to four cents a kilometer. That's right, yeah, well, 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 let me thank you for that question. <coughs> is, I, I know that there's a strong connection in the, in the consumer market between people that have photovoltaics on their house <clears throat> and those that want plug-in cars or those that are thinking about a plug-in car and saying, as soon as I get one, I'm gonna buy a solar array for my house. Um, when you guys, uh, Costa and, and Luke, when you guys are doing this analysis, is, does that factor in? I mean, is that such a, is that a niche or is it really something that's gonna start to creep into your analysis? Well, I, the analysis that I talked about did not include that. Um, which would, I think, make it a more conservative analysis. Um, but was I, what I mentioned in my, you know, uh, under the principles for the uh, public utility commissions is they should be providing direction or incentives or sm uh, streamlining the process by which, hey, if I'm going to go uh, look at an electric car and I'm interested in uh, bringing one home, then, you know, my utility should be involved or whoever or the 
hook me up with a consultant that can tell me how I'm going to get those solar panels on my roof. What size do I need? Am I in a good place to do it? There's no reason not to tie those things directly together in the process. 